Yes, hello everyone. Welcome to Bookshare. We're live. Look at that. Game Wizards sub for their 19th month. I got to say thank you on the call, which is lovely. Lanky Moles just dropping five gift subs as well. What? Jade Cup Main Hands, G323, Fate Photo, Adam Abrera, and Zeka all got gifted a sub. Thank you, Lanky Mole. Look at you coming in here, doing some good stuff. Uh, Vaden cheering as well now that we got a hype train. Uh, and KP Dub says, Hey there, let's talk some shit about Martian potatoes. <laughs> Jerry, thanks for the sub as well. This is the first stream of the month being May. It's gonna be my, my. Um, May the 4th be with you. Hi, Colleen. Uh, Thierry, 20 months on a 12 month streak. You love to see it. Hi, level three's already happened. Drugs. <laughs> Okay. Drugs. This is awkward. No, thank, thank you. you. Yes. Who, in, who invited? Oh, that is my favorite TikTok saying. It sounds like it's Kristen Wiig. I don't know what the quote's from, but it's. I always think that that's Kristen. Oh no, thank you. Oh no, we're good. Um, and Kristen Wiig is in the Martian. How's that for a segue? Oh, you're working late tonight, Michelle. Oh boo. That's all right. Uh, hi, play the board. May the fourth be with you. Gory says it's Revenge of the Fifth over here. Yeah, you're in the future. Avery's working late tonight as well. Oh, it's all happening. This book's good. I like Andy here. I like his science fiction slash adventures that we get. Um, if you're a part of the Patreon uh, tier that not only gives you access to the show but gives you access to the chat that we have hashtag reading it exists in the discord uh, but only if you are a paid backer you get access also to the notes that I um, draft up and some talking points and we've got the doc happening there um, oh wow Colleen says I found myself trying to find the different areas on my Mars globe I'm fancy just having a Mars globe on standby that's easy Jerry says we have to do Artemis, Artemis at one point. I've got it. I bought it. I'm ready to go. Apparently people say it's not as good as these two. I already have a favorite book uh, and we will be talking about that too. Game Wizard says the book is good and the movie is pretty uh, a pretty faithful adaptation for the most part. Um, I'm going to be watching it. Hector has suggested that we all go watch it 3D and I said I don't know, I made a potato poop joke, I'm sure. But I was like, yeah, hell yeah, let's do that. So hopefully um, I will have seen that movie. I did not look at casting before getting into the book. The hardest part for me was the audio. I will be getting into that. But I basically listened to the first half twice. Mum's halfway through but couldn't make it tonight. But mum will be in next week, which is great. I'm excited about that. Um, we got a really full chat happening again tonight, which is cool. Um, sometimes it's hit and miss depending on the book. Some people opt out of books. Um, sometimes it's hard when we're starting a series because it's quite a commitment. Uh, but when it's a standalone book that we kind of know is going to be a fun, decent read, um, I notice people get more. Yes, I saw that, Thierry. I've got it open as well. Um, but usually when we start this, we do a spoiler-free weigh-in. I've got some thoughts, but I'm going to randomly start selecting people to talk about theirs. If you have it ready to go and you want to volunteer, unmute now and you can tell me your spoiler-free thoughts of the first half of the book. Otherwise, I will be selecting people. KP Dubs. Yeah, I just really, really love both the science and the humor of this book. Uh, it's just so much fun. I'm... I've always been into science. You know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. So all this stuff is, is so much fun. Um, you know, hearing them talk about like, hey, that's why we do algebra in, in school, kids. Um, and then, of course, I'm a little older. So all those 70s TV shows, I was laughing so hard because I knew everything. <laughs> he talks about like the one where Mr. Roper saw something out of context. I'm like, yes, I've seen that episode. Wow. So much fun. Yeah. Yeah, I that <laughs> 
okay, so you like the references, you like the error, and you like the fact that it's almost like what life could have been if you if your dreams maintained that of your six year old self. Yeah, possibly. Okay. Gory's come in and said four point five out of five bombs. I love this book and I love Will's narration too. If you wanna if you wanna write it, I'm more than happy to read it. Cash 22, you just said it. You're waiting to be voluntold by Maud. <laughs> me being voluntold. You sound like a robot. I do. I don't know what's going on with my mic, but I can't figure out how to fix it. So we're just going to have to deal with robot Tim. Okay. I, my apologies. No, that's okay. It's actually not so bad. I wonder if you put your mouth closer to the microphone, if it helps. Maybe. I don't know. Anyways, uh, I enjoyed. I'm, I'm enjoying this book, not as much as I enjoyed Project Hail Mary. Why is that? I, I don't know. I just haven't been able to get into it as much as Project Hail Mary. Um, not sure why. Just I think I know why. Haven't been able to. I do enjoy again, like the way Andy Weir describes, like the engineering and the science that goes into it. I'm enjoying that. Just don't have quite the same feel as PHM to me anyways. So I think that when PHM starts you off with amnesia and you and it's first person and he is frantically trying to uncover information with quite a bit of humor straight out the gate, um, I think it's far more easy to be enraptured by that sort of like slowly peeling back process and you know the, the unveiling of information. I think in this particular book, we get a bit of an onslaught of information. It's a first person, quite scientific journal entry um, of what could be considered despair. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a desperate, desolate sort of situation to be in. Um, and so it kind of hits you with all of that at once instead of kind of like taking you on a bit of a journey. So I agree with you completely. I felt that the first few chapters of this was actually a little bit hard for me and the way that they were breaking down science wasn't in a way that was trying to learn with the audience, the reader. Hi, Albert17. Thanks so much for the follow. Welcome to Book Chat. We're talking about The Martian. Um, but instead he's talking to you like he's your astronaut colleague. Um, <laughs> and that was just like, bleh. And you're like, oh, okay. Good luck, buddy. Um, so yeah, I, I so totally get that and why you think that. Um, Miss Necromancy, you said five out of five. Talk me through that. Yeah, I'm really, really liking it so far. I don't like it as much as Project Hail Mary, but you know, I think few books are going to be on that level, not just by Andy Weir, but by any author. So while I don't like it as much as Project Hail Mary, that doesn't mean I'm not really, really enjoying it. Still a good book. Yeah, it's still really thoroughly enjoyable. What are the parts that you're digging? Spoilers. I just like the whole thing. Like, I mean, I didn't find the science to be too much. So I, I'm enjoying the science aspect of it. And I really enjoy Andy Weir's sense of humor. So especially after reading a bunch of, you know, I fantasy burnout and then I read some other books that I was super disappointed in. I'm just really enjoying myself reading this book. I have been so interested in your Goodreads ratings because you give a really great little synopsis or a blurb on why you're giving the said rating. And now you've been sucked into book talk. There's a, a few of us, I think we can kind of like raise hands, it's a safe space. Aaron, I know you're deep on book talk. Uh, you like to post a bunch that you have found in the reading section. About 80% of my feed at the moment is about um, book talk as well. And it turns out I'm not the only one in my 30s who is like holding female written male characters to a unrealistic standard for living, breathing men. <laughs> cool. Um, but I want to hear about the book talk books that shut the bed for you. <laughs> you hate it and to warn people to not read them. Me? Yeah. Oh, There's a couple God. where you actually really do need to give book readers a bit of a heads up just to avoid. Uh, well, the first one 
in the three strikes and book talks out was inheritance game which was like kind of like the like a knives out sort of like advertised as that i know it i was, was interested in that one garbage Ugh. hot stinky garbage because it was like a book written in the 2020s that fails the bechdel test Ugh. written by a woman no mind and it's just peak of you know that meme where it's got like the YA like love interest and it's like the two guys and they look exactly the same except one's got different hair color? Yes. It's that. Got it. It was just so bad. And then the second one I read, I read Atlas Six, which is everywhere on Book Talk. And yeah. I mean I really like Dark Academia, so I was expecting them. I'd probably really like that one. But it was so boring. And it was in a way it like kind of advertised itself as all the characters being like villains or morally ambiguous and it was they weren't villains at all they were like quote unquote bad guys in a way that a 15 year old thinks people are bad where it's just like i'm so misunderstood and morally gray you'll never know how <laughs> dark my thoughts are it's like just make some one of these people like irredeemable assholes not like but it, it felt very like they were villains but in a way that someone on Twitter wouldn't call them problematic. You know what I mean? So it was just so boring and pretentious and just dumb. And right, then I that read was Atlas Six, by the way, everyone. Yeah. Last and then time. I read a horror one that everyone was like, oh, this book is so disturbing. And I was like, okay, I gotta check it out. It's called Cows. Do not read this book. Because well, A is slaughter punk, so that's like a subgenre that only a certain Slaughterpunk? It's like a slaughter punk. It's like extreme horror. I will so, like, never read this book. It's like the book version of like August Underground or a Serbian film level of extreme horror. So it's like intense gore, violence, every body fluid you could ever imagine, like sexual violence, cannibalite, all oh, it's it's everything. But it was just bad, badly written too. I, it was like, well, because good horror has acceleration. Like, you don't start a roller coaster in the middle of the loop. You have to build up, right? And bad That's horror doesn't horror know how to do that. Up. Yeah. You have to, yeah, exactly. So those were, the, that, those were the ones that I was like, you know what? I'm not the target audience for book talk. So I'm just going to read my own books. And if it happens to get on book talk, fine. My book talk and your book talk sound very, very different. Mine is like... Every every single thing that I swipe through, it's just like women obsessed with Rune Dannon <laughs> from the Crescent uh, City series. And there's a song that someone remixed, and it's been in my head for three weeks. Because every time it's like doom doom doom, I go doom doom doom. I'm like, all right, everyone, we all need to just stop obsessing over this half-shaved head, long-haired, pointy-eared, <laughs> Faye. <laughs> Um, but I really do appreciate giving everyone a heads up for that, especially that last one. That sounds absolutely rotten. Blech. Um, but you're giving this one a five out of five as well. Uh, Sprinkles, four out of five. How are you liking this one? You there? I'm there, yes. Sorry. Four out of five. Yes, four out of five. So, um, as I was saying prior to the stream, um, I was enjoying the book. You know, very much so. Uh, one of my one of my favorite scenes in the book is no, when the tooth no, gets impaled. Spoiler free! Spoiler free! Oh, sorry. It's all right. The bottom line: it's in the beginning of the book, so it's not it's not too difficult. You open up first page or two. Oh, oh my goodness! Uh, but that's not the point. Um, spoiler free. Yes, I enjoyed how it worked. You know, I enjoyed the the character interactions. I enjoyed how it was. Uh, you know written but you know there obviously you know there's some some dull parts but um uh going back to my original point i was watching resident alien and that was a good combination of the martian you know uh i don't know if you've seen resident alien but it's with alan tunic and he's phenomenal the whole cast is but anyway uh, just saying it's a good combination well-written book that's that's my piece. Got it. 
But a four out of five because there's some slow parts. Loud and clear. Fatal Flower, are you there? You're not in the chat. Do you want to write how why you're giving it a five out of five? Or jump in and let us know? Um, Aaron, you're saying 4.5 out of 5. Aaron, why are you giving it a 4.5 out of 5? Oh. There you are. Aaron. Uh, mostly it's just going off of like my memory and then watching the film, but uh, for the most part, I just really enjoy it because I kind of wrote that it's like Castaway, but with, in space That's and also with humor because mm -hmm. uh, while Tom Hanks had some funny moments, it's like it was still kind of depressing thing because he's just by himself. He has nobody to talk to except a, a volleyball, Wilson. But here it's like uh, he's doing video logs and, you know, just explaining the process and stuff like that. So it's like you're more engaged with the character that way. But yeah, I, it's just a really good, fun sci-fi, you know, try to get home, journey home type of story. That actually is, brings up a really good point because one of the biggest themes of this book is isolation. Um, I don't know if we would have thought it would be so fun and awesome and such a great read if it was two or even one year ago. There's nothing like being isolated from family, yeah. friends, loved ones, and having your own company and being stuck in four and, walls. Well, not only that, but it's like he's so isolated. It's like he has no access to any medical things. Like, at least our isolation, if we had to go out, we could. It's just to you know, take precautions here. It's like if he tries to go out without taking the right precautions, he's dead. And he kind of explains a little bit that the loneliness is probably what would kill him. Starvation, other, other yeah. things, but like... Yeah, I, I'm definitely going to go into that big one, connection and communication. Um, there was a really powerful line in and, there that I think was not emphasized, but put in and it just packed a punch when I read it. And, and, and I know that this is mostly focused on the book, but one thing I did like with the movie is most of the narration from the book is actually done in the film. But he's doing it and they did it in a nice clever way where they use like you know video logs like he's just basically speaking to a camera like okay i'm logging for posterity just in case i die and somebody comes back and finds me they can see how i was how i survived how i got through so nice way of like you know keep keeping the actor engaged with the audience without making it seem yep. right <laughs> yep i get that i haven't i've watched the movie be before but i haven't watched it recently I'm going to watch it in the next few days um, but I really didn't want to look at casting I wanted to kind of go into this with my own imagination yeah. and not be kind of skewed too much Colleen you're saying you love this book and his sense of humor is great what are you kind of giving it out of five with the first impressions oh we had you just for a second Sorry, I get tremors in my hands, and so sometimes toggle the button instead of hitting it. Oh, I know you're totally fine. Um, I'll probably give it a five. Ooh. I I love the science in it. Um, there was only one little little thing that I kind of question about the science, but if you change that, you'd lose the whole story. So. Um, you know, I'll, I'll let that pass. We'll but, actually um, hold that thought. I do want to unpack that. I really do want to get into the science behind it. Um, we'll get everyone's thoughts and then we'll get back to that. I okay, know. well, I, I like his sense of humor. And I think um, the key to survival with anything is not giving up hope. And as devastating as it is for Mark to be alone on this uh, planet, all by you know, and miss everybody so much, he hangs on to hope. Mm. And I think that's the real message there. And uh, he manages, he uses humor to cope with a lot of things. Yeah. Which is, that, not that's only also, fun. oh, sorry, you go. Yeah. And that's also an excellent coping mechanism and one I can relate to. <laughs> Agree. But also like the psychology behind it, I thought was really fascinating as well. Like building out a dynamic and that being his quality was a big reason why he was a part of the team. I thought that was br brilliant. 
Faden, you're not liking it as much. Three out of five. What's uh, what's got you out of three? Um, so basically, there's a few things. Uh, I think the writing in general is just much better. It was much better in Project Hill Mirror compared to this, but the the biggest difference, I would say, overall, is just characters. Like the characters in Project Hill Mary were much more interesting and had much more like a depth and to them. Basically, um, like the, the biggest the way I know it's different essentially is comes with um, choices they make. Like Wani doesn't make a lot of like hard choices, neither does the team in general. Like the crew, like Lewis makes one that's important early, but <laughs> other other one, yeah. Otherwise, though, like in Hail Mary, there's a lot more choices Strauss and, and, and Grace make and those impact like like the, the, their decision making and impact what they think of their characters what they you know what kind of person they are mm -hmm. a lot more so it gives a lot more depth to them and here I feel like Wally's just kind of like a, a hero character he's a good guy he's positive everything's great he doesn't have as many flaws and that's makes him a little more one-dimensional to me oh that's a really interesting observation I really dig that um but the thing is I would be interested to know that without the comparison of Project Hail Mary, if it would still be a three or if Project Hail Mary is casting such a shadow on it um, that you're like, oh, you've done, you've done better. You're probably right. I mean, I think if I read in a different order, it would have been, it would change my mind for sure. Yeah. But I mean, hey, that's how the cookie crumbles. Um, have who, Darian, you're up. What are you giving it? High infinite minus, by the way. I would give this a 4.5 out of 5. Love it. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. Um, I mean, I listened to this twice over the last three years. How many times? Twice well, in the last three or four years. Wow, that's pretty good, though. It's the kind of book yeah. that you want to keep coming back to. Hold yep. on, isn't it? Um, Isaac, he's not in here. Isaac reads this book once a year, apparently. I thought it was. Okay, so you're on your second read for this one. Um, Chris says, the log format is a little different when the change of perspective from first person to third it is not too harsh. Okay, I get that. That was one of my questions that I had. Um, <laughs> when did I swear earlier? Uh, I, I believe that I did though. Oh, do blinks in here and then not? I'm just not, oh, you're here, you're not on the Discord. Oh, all right. Well, I, Isaac, I've been talking about you. <laughs> You'll have to tell me. I'm just catching up on the chat. Sorry, I get so slow with this sort of stuff. Um, in the interim, Jay Bunch Rock, tell us me uh, your spoiler three thoughts so far. I, yeah, I thought, I agreed with you when you said it, you it started to get a bit of tedious. I thought he, he inserted the, the earth in that storyline just at the right moment to keep it engaged. Yep. Yep. Because I thought I kind of read it, you know, kind of like I did this, then I did that, then this happened, then I did this. So I was happy when the, the other characters started to get added into the story. Agreed. Other than that, Agreed. I really like it. And uh, I kind of like that we read Project Help Mary first because we can see how much he's improved as a writer. It's kind of like he took the Martian progress and said, what if I raise the stakes by a million percent? Not only that, yeah. but I feel like he had the um, feedback of exactly what you're talking about. Um, the yeah. way that this is written with journal excerpts, a daily entry, and it's a very isolated and he's on his own. Um, I noticed that in Project Hail Mary, there's, yes, he's by himself, but it was the, the unveiling of the information that was a lot more riveting. But then that balance of what, um, when he his amnesia started to subside, he would do flashbacks. And the flashbacks were really, really fun because he was a part of those memories. And so what's happening now, um, you're right, you've got this single singular hero character and then other things are happening with this ensemble team, but we don't have their relationship really. And we actually don't really know Mark, much about Mark Watney as a character. We've only got a handful of um, in bits of information, but we don't know how old he is. We don't know if he's married. We don't know... We just know he's a botanist. Um, his psychiatric evaluation, that he has a good sense of humor and that he's very resourceful. Um, but we just don't really know this guy who's trapped up in space. And I guess my question for everyone, even though I still want to get through everyone's first initial thoughts, is 
Are we rooting for this guy that they won't really tell us who he is? Hi, just a fun guy. Welcome to book chat. We're talking about the Martian. If you've seen it, let us know in the chat. Um, but that's that's. I wouldn't say rooting for him. I'm more just like wanting to see how it turns out. That's the best way I could say. Yeah, but I mean, it did, Vaden, I think this is kind of talking about your point of that emotional disconnect from our hero character. Do you think it was like because we just don't know enough about him and he's not really sharing who he is or his life? He's sharing just the mission and the the info? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, there's, like I said, there's not much information on him. We, we learn about the crew through their media they like, like the, through his company show, the disco, but we really know what he what he's so much into besides the, obviously the, the botany stuff. And like I said, the lack of a family, lack of like a family back home, it has the parents it's just, mm. and friends, like it has a crew. It's just, it feels, yeah, we're definitely feeling like there's a big gap there. Yeah. I just read Catch 22's comment. Is anyone worried about Andy Weir? So far, all of his novels are about being completely isolated from humanity for long periods of time. I guess when you have an interest that is space, um, one of the scariest things about space is the infinite nature of it all. And it the, that is like the first sort of, um conversation that you would have about space because little things that go wrong have big 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 consequences um and i think that uh isolation and the vastness of it all is the most compelling and frightening thing about space which is why like you know following these astronauts and hearing about their training i thought was a little bit interesting i like i like this ensemble where, where it's like You've got someone that has a specialty each. The only problem is, should you remove one from the equation, it becomes unbalanced. Um, but he's removed every other crewmate from the, um... oh my God, brain fog. <laughs> it's been going on for like two weeks now as well. I'm just halfway through a sentence. I'm like, don't know the word. I'm probably not going to keep talking. I'm just going to fade out and someone will, someone will pick up. And um, when you're hosting a show by yourself, <laughs> you just don't have that luxury. <laughs> um, I can't remember what I was saying either. But yeah, Catch-22, space is beautiful and space is one scary, scary bitch. Um, so I, I, I think that Andy has definitely gone on record to say that he just loves and is fascinated by space and science. And so it's it's obvious to write about that that side of it but he also did write project hail mary when the pandemic was happening so to write about what he was experiencing makes a lot of sense as well um thank you actc fatal flower says i'm making dinner tonight so i'm not in the discord i love andy weir's writing style combined with all of the science and the humor i did like project hail mary more but let's be fair this book doesn't have a rocky so there's no way to compare. Let's actually get a poll up, Gory, if you're there. Let's just do a vote, Project Hail Mary or The Martian. Which one's your favorite? Let's just see what this split looks like. Um, Kate says there's so much to think about in his situation too. Like one brain fart and he's dead, let alone if he has a mechanical malfunction. And he, I think he had like maybe one or two meltdowns in the first half of the book. That was it. Um, we still need to get to Thierry and Lisa for spoiler-free thoughts. Uh, Lisa, I'm going to go over to you first. Um, right now I'm probably sending out a four out of five stars. Mm -hmm. I am enjoying it. I, I still like his humor that he puts in his writing, but I definitely think I was more invested in Project Hail Mary than I am with this. I don't know if it's also maybe a product of me having already seen the movie that might be throwing it off because okay. um, I already know what happens. But I do like it. The, the science stuff for me this time was a little bit more boring to read. Um, but I felt exactly otherwise the same I, way. Yeah, I still like the humor. I still like um, the way he deals with the isolation of space and all that. I, I like how he does all that, but definitely uh, still at a four star. We'll see if it gets any better for me, but I think that's probably where I'm going to be sitting. I think I'm about a four and a half. I still really, really like it, but there was one spot and I re-listened to it again this morning where he's just 
by himself and he's obviously kind of going, all right, I need to survive. I need to live. Um, let's do an inventory and a stock check and let's see where we're at. And it 100% read like Mark has 400 days to, li- <laughs> to live, but Mark only has four portions, six portions of food for, you know, a uh, portion of food for six people over X amount of time. How fucked is Mark? And it's like him doing the equation. Um, and for me, it, it felt like I was literally doing a test question at one point where I'm like, I felt that, and great point, Aaron, where you're like, there's literally 10 years difference between Martian and Project Hail Mary. So you can see how he clearly grew as a writer. And I think maybe he got feedback where it was just like, you know, not dumb it down, but majority of your readers aren't going to thoroughly understand science as if it's a second language. And that's why I thought that his delivery with science and how he would explain it, and he used sort of like two ways to do that. The first was to prove himself um, as a scientist to Strat, and the second was to literally teach an alien (laughs) what it means. And when you have a character that knows nothing and you have a person explain it, a lot of television Uh, And movie writers will do this and use this as a way to deliver exposition without bogging down the story. And in this way, Andy Weir is able to explain science in that way. But I think that when you have an astronaut who is doing a audiovisual diary to NASA, it does not matter if we can analyze or understand it. Uh, Project Hail Mary only came in at 60%. I thought that was going to clean sweep it at like a 90% for sure. That's nearly an even split. There you go. Um, yeah, KP Dub says, The Martian, Earth tries to save one man. Project Hail Mary, one man tries to save Earth. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. That's really, really interesting. Aaron says, bookmark, I do feel disconnected, which is why I gave him a 4.5. But movie mark, I rooted for, because you can literally visualize a person in this situation. Kate says, yeah, I feel like Project Hail Mary was, we were invested in his journey as a character, while The Martian, we're invested in the story, in the frontier aspect of Mars, and Mark is kind of like a self-insertion character. Mm, There you go. Play the board says, I like watching Mark work a problem. He's an astronaut. And I think that goes to the core of his personality. It was enough for me to feel connected. Thank you, play the board. Lovely having your input. The Bob Din says, no one can hear you scream in space or so I've heard. (laughs) Uh, Jimmy says, the unknown is certainly scary and space is mostly unknown. We have a first time chatter in here. Hello, Star Pilot 6. Thanks for the follow three minutes ago, by the way. I don't mind him being a bit of a cipher since I'm capable of projecting my own ideas of him. It'd matter more if he was heavily interacting with other people and still had no idea what kind of person he was. Wow, for a first comment, that was fantastic. Welcome to freaking Book Chat Star Pilot 6. That's a really great observation, a really good point with that one. Hmm. Kate says, as a social animal... The isolation of space is also a real thing we have to deal with as humans and also a real threat because it can break us down psychologically, which, if you're isolated in space, is a death sentence. Baden just gifted a sub to Star Pilot 6. That's so sweet, Baden. Thank you for making new people into the community feel so welcome. I appreciate that. Um... Vaden says to Kate, I wish Watney was isolated for a longer period of time so we could see how it affected him. We're only halfway through this book and we got him for four years by himself. I was thinking about that. If it's 2022, if it's 2022 right now, it means that in 2018, we got dropped off on a planet and we were the only person there. So so for the For the last four years of your life, where were you in 2018? Guess what? You're still fucking there and you've had no one to talk to this entire time. Oh, I wouldn't be able to go so well. Thierry, first thoughts. Spoiler free, what we got? I gave it a 4.5 out of 5 because I gave Project Elmeri a 5 out of 5. Now, you've read all Andy Weir's books. What time reading this one is it? This one is the first time. I'm not done yet. I'm only on chapter 22. Yes, I read it ahead too. today. You but read uh, yeah. Hail Mary once? Yeah, with the book club. And then Artemis once. Artemis, I think I read it twice now. Ooh, 
Or where does that, where does, because I don't think many of us have read Artemis, if any of us, and we've all read Project Hail Mary pretty much. Where does Artemis compare? Uh, I'll keep the rating when we do it. Okay. I don't want, I don't want to hype it up or uh, dis, discredit the book. Okay. Okay. I mean, we did just have Kate in here just vehemently um, stop people from reading three books, but I mean, I it's it's a diff. This is different because we're probably. I would say that gonna read it. Artemis is very different than the Martian and Project Elmer because like, there's like not really it. isolation with the main character. I kind of like hearing that because KP Dubs put it so well. We've got. Earth trying to save one man in this book and in Project Hail Mary, it's one man trying to save Earth. And so it's like, it's kind of nice having something that is completely different from the both sides of this story that we're telling. Uh, Catch-22 wants to remind everyone that the rating was solely based on the first half of the book and it is subject to change. Kate says, I feel like Mark has so much to do and think about and uh through the and thought, sorry, that the isolation won't affect him as much if, as if he were stuck in an automated spaceship. Again, I think Project Hail Mary, and sorry if you haven't read it, we covered it in January and we absolutely salivated over that book. We, it was the highest rated book that we've ever done. All of us recommended it. I put it onto my entire family. I freaking love that book. But what was really interesting was the discussion and breakdown and problem solving of interstellar travel and um, being in isolation for years and what that can do and statistically basically if you are isolated in a room with four other people you're likely to kill them <laughs> but I liked how it broke down the psychology of what really does happen to people um, we haven't seen it yet in the first half of the book but the fact that they are interviewing the psychiatric specialist, uh, they're my favorite moments of that. The, we've had one, but that was my favorite moment of the book where it's understanding the human psyche in these extreme circumstances. And I kind of wish that we, and maybe it will happen, but we go back to the psychiatrist and was like, all right, there's a projected um, four years that he's going to be in isolation. What can we expect? And hearing that information um, because that helps me get inside Mark's head in a place where he likely won't let people in or doesn't really want them to see as well. Um, I'm still reading through the chat here. Uh, KP Dub says, he's the best damn botanist on the whole planet. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. Clever guy says, lost at sea, you can still take your helmet off and breathe and your blood won't boil in your veins if your clothes tear. Oh my God, Colleen, what an amazing way to say that. There's even something as purifying as just having fresh air. Here he's restricted to a certain amount of time. Oh, that just made me feel claustrophobic just reading that. Having a helmet stuck on pretty much anytime you leave a small space. And that's the thing, he's stuck in the rover. He's stuck in small, confined places. <sighs> Chris says, this is a space geek book for space geeks. Project Hail Mary is a little bit more entertaining and a broader scope. Agree. Um, oh, Pai Lang says, Gigi, I have this book on my read list. Uh, a train leaves the station traveling at 100 kilometers an hour. Exactly. Um, obviously catching up to chat a little bit late. Thank you, Gaia, for giving me the results. I'm only just seeing them now. Ooh, ooh. B Rock Vandal says, I do my I do find myself liking Mark because he's so good at being a smart ass. I like that. Um Game Wizard says, Oh, I gotta drop out early. It's supper is ready. Ah, oh, that's great. I'll see you next week and my, you'll meet my mum. Uh KP Dub says, I like that there were few to no descriptions of the characters. I can make them look and sound however I want in my head. Sometimes the only descriptor or the only evidence that you will have of these people are their last names. Kapoor, Sanders, Henderson, Martinez, Vogel, Beck, Johansson. Um, it's sort of like the origin of their name is, is the only sort of, it's not even a descriptor, but it's the only evidence of sort of how you can picture them. Um, I've listened to two different narrators narrate this book. Uh, 
I love the narrator of Project Hail Mary. Someone will tell me in the comments and I'll read it in 15 minutes. Um, but he did different, he did very, very specific voices for every character. R.C. Bradley, who I've been listening to, does a slight version and Will Wheaton doesn't really change at all. Um, I find that if someone puts on a different voice, I can differentiate between the characters a lot better and it's super helpful when listening to audiobook. <sighs> um, Gaia says, I'm feeling like I have an interesting perspective since I've yet to read Project Hail Mary. I'm loving The Martian so far. Star Pilot 6 says, I liked Artemis, but for me it just wasn't as good as The Martian, but I haven't read Project Hail Mary yet myself. Oh, you are in for a treat, Star Pilot 6. Um... Oh, stuck in the hab with the smell, says B-Rock Vandal. Ugh, I know. Um, Ray Porter. Sorry, Ray Porter. Thank you, Vaden. Ray Porter is the narrator of Project Hail Mary and crushed it. Second best narrator I've ever heard in audiobooks. Piling says, I like narrators that add voices more colorful to listen to and distinguish characters. Yes, because for me, Teddy Sanders and Mitch Henderson are the interchangeable. They are the same person to me. They are two white dudes and I don't I don't know how to differentiate that. I think one of them leads um, JPL and another one is higher up. Um, Will got better as he went, but yeah, I agree. He was a little bland. He's better suited to full-on comedy books like Red Shirts. Um, I struggled with Will's at the start um, because I think that he – does a much better job being a very enthusiastic teenage nerd uh, in something like Ready Player One than a that really difficult sort of juxtaposition between someone who's very, very smart and serious and an astronaut and knows his shit but also about to literally lose his shit <laughs> and use his shit but – um, lose his mind and so uses that humor as a coping mechanism. So it's almost like this very delicate balance, but all of those parts are so important, um, which I'm interested to see if Matt Damon really does nail that. Like I can understand why Matt jumped at the chance to do this because it's such a fascinating character. Uh, Lisa says, if Ray Porter is your second favorite narrator, who is your first how do we not know that in this book chat? I'm sure that someone can answer that. <laughs> I've recommended him all the time. After I wrote it, I figured it was probably James Marston, Masters. Yeah, it is James Masters doing all of the Dresden Files. He's my numero uno. He's just the best. Um, <laughs> Chris goes, Spike! <laughs> uh, e e yeah. Yeah. Um, Thierry says, I liked Will better in this than in Ready Player One, but that's me. I, I ended up listening to, yeah, the, um, R.C. Bradley's narration. The problem was the way, the format, there was no adjustment of the speed. So I was, I was like, I can listen to my friend have a conversation and try and not picture him as my friend having a conversation with me and try and have him as Mark Watney and I couldn't disassociate Will's voice to make him someone else being Mark Watney and so I turned to an unfamiliar voice and I couldn't listen to it at 1.5 I listened to it on 1.0 and this dude sounded drunk until I could you know get back from that uh, play the board says I like Will Wheaton um, in his own right but I read the Martian when it first came out I started it again as soon as uh, I got to the end. Oh, wow. I've listened to the original narration multiple times. I had a, diff a difficult time blending my perception of Mark, the familiar voice of someone who I'm a fan of. There you go, play the board. We're in exactly the same uh, headspace with that. Pai Lang said, thought it was neat Matt D was in Interstellar and The Martian. Guess he liked space. Don't we all like a little space sometimes? Um, all right, let's get into some of these questions. Colleen, I'm dying to know, what was the science snafu that you faced? What was something that you that just didn't sit well with you but you had to push through because it was the crux of the story? 
Well, he's uh, he's a hundred percent right about the sandstorms and the high winds, but the the atmosphere is so thin on Mars. I'm not sure it would actually have the capability of blowing over a spaceship and doing some of the damage that's suggested. Um, even the storms, if I understand correctly, are quite low to the ground um, because the atmosphere is too thin, so it doesn't have the same um, impact that like a sandstorm here on Earth would have. Um, you know, here we've got, if you get a high wind, you've got all that air pressure um, that can really make things move. On Mars, not so much. Confession chat, did anyone else, did that cross anyone else's mind or is Colleen just brilliant? Did anyone else think, oh, I don't know, weight and atmosphere and... I think Colleen's just brilliant, period. But, you know, I didn't catch that. Hear, hear. Well said, Jimmy. Um, KPW said same. You agree? KP Dubs, that crossed your mind? I'll read his comment. If Mars's atmosphere is 1%... Oh, sorry. I'll go I didn't you. realize you were calling on me. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'd have to run the math, but it seems like, logically, if Mars' atmosphere is 1% as dense as Earth's, wouldn't a 100-mile-an-hour Mars wind feel like a 1-mile-per-hour Earth wind? It would have to be one heck of a sandstorm to start blowing over stuff. The chat is saying she's brilliant. She's too smart for me to follow. <laughs> uh, but Pai Lang said she's right about the storms. They asked NASA about uh, about that when they launched the Mars rovers. All right, so there's a couple. There's a couple of the smart people. Everyone else is just here with the popcorn going, just tell me the story. <laughs> I'll believe it all. Uh, but Star Pilot 6 came in with some facts on that one, saying, I believe that Weir himself admitted that that was his one big cheat. Uh, with respect to realism. So he kind of, you're right, uh, Colleen, you had to suspend disbelief just enough that it's not likely that that could happen. But in this case, for the sake of the story, it is happening. Uh, Chris says, I lost all my high school chemistry. <laughs> Mate, <laughs> I don't science very well at all. Um, Vaden says that Colleen is brilliant. You, you very much are, though. Well done. Um, Guy says, I think in a story of all this science, you just want to trust uh, what it's telling you, 100%. I know if they told me 10 things and one was a lie, I couldn't tell you what the lie was. Um, there you go. Okay, uh, other things that I want to bring up. Um, the talking points that I have in the doc, we'll go over some of these. Um, we've touched upon the similarities to Project Hail Mary, dealing with risk-taking, isolation, scientific breakthroughs, and subject matter. Sounds like we're all on a general consensus that Project Hail Mary is a little bit superior in the way that they tell the story and um, omit, or sorry, uh, uh, share, inform the information. Literally inform is in the word information mode. Well done. Um did the start have you hooked is what we kind of talked about as well. For some, the rush of information and the more advanced science that was happening wasn't um, detrimental to the gripping story at the start. I, I took a little bit. I had to listen to the first chapter a couple of times. I was like, what? <laughs> I just didn't get it. Um, but that's me. I was waiting for... I don't know who I am. I can't even say my name. Wow, what is happening? Where am I? You know, and then I got, I'm absolutely screwed. <laughs> and let me just crunch some numbers to tell you why. I was like, I just get the calculator. Um, Burke, oh, 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 thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to Book Chat. We are covering The Martian by Andy Weir. We've read the first half of the book, so we're going to touch on the first half of the book. And then next week, same time, we're going to be doing the whole book with Mama Garrett. Terry said, wouldn't things be less heavy on Mars because of the difference in gravity and air density? Likely, yeah. 
Guy said, I'm thoroughly enjoying The Martian, especially by the time I hit this week's stopping point. First, ah, oh, B-Rock Vandal gifted a sub to the Waco Kid, 512. Thank you. Um, at first, it was a lot of information being thrown at us. It wasn't until NASA discovered Mark uh, was alive that I realized how cool it was. As the reader, I knew how hard Mark was working to stay alive. So I ended up loving how much Andy told us in Mark's log entries. Gaia, what a fantastic observation. I feel exactly the same way with that. Yes, well put. Very well said with that. What did KP Dub say? Oh, yeah, weight and mass are different things. Oh, my God, guys. <laughs> they are. Weight and mass are different. That is when I would opt out of that conversation. I would just opt out. I'll be like, I'll ask someone that knows or I will look it up. Yikes. Alrighty. So was the science described in a way that you understood slash helped the story? I think that's a bit split. I think the Lisa and the Mords of the chat are just like, hey, <laughs> you tell me what it is and that's what it is and I'll believe it. And it sounds great to me. But then other people are talking about, all right, Catch-22, unmute. Tell me the difference between mass and weight. <laughs> Okay. So mass is how much stuff something is made of, and weight is that plus the force of gravity. So like you've heard of kilograms, that is a measurement of mass, and then when you apply gravity, you get newtons. So in US standard units, pounds is a measure of weight. So if you divide that by the force of gravity, you get slugs. <laughs> which is the unit of mass. And that's how they're different. It's all application of gravity. Why wouldn't they just be the same thing if we're all on the planet doing the stuff? No, they're different because if you want to go, if you don't say you were... It just sounds like, so okay, repetitive. So you sound like you know, a droid. Say I'm 65, if I'm 65 kilograms on Earth and I weigh 180 pounds, that's really bad math, but I'm just using numbers, right? If I go to the moon, I won't weigh 180 pounds, but I'll still be 65 kilograms because the moon but, has less gravity. So what I do, because I only have a finite amount of space in my brain to process and prioritize, I go, will I ever need to know what I weigh in space? And my brain goes, nah. Let's just leave room Go to space. so that yes. you can know that in 2004, Sienna Miller, um, Jude Law cheated on Sienna Miller with, I don't know, his wife with Sienna and the nanny. That's what, so, that's what took that up instead, you know. Britney Spears' I mean, is second husband well, was Kevin Federline. Two boys. Um, just to add to Cash Time to his point, Gravity also has variations, although very slight on Earth. So mass would be a constant, while weight would vary depending on where you are. Yeah. You can, don't, no, the, the, the voice in my head saying, don't talk about that, Maud. We don't need to bring that up. <laughs> So I'm not going to say it, which is really big of me. Ridian has just gifted 10 subs to the community. Lock CJ Wen got one. King Ruxia got one. My own biggest fan got one. Eli J, CT Rubicon, K Frito, Nice 13, or Nice, Capalicious, Odin Mercer, Mrs. Soap and Clay. You all got gifted a sub thanks to Ridian. Ridian, you now at the pole position, number one, um, in the gifted subs. Thank you so much for doing that. Piling says, of course you do. When you go on a blue rocket to space, it's fun to know your weight. You know what? That is the one thing that I'll be doing when it comes to rockets, waiting. I do not need to do that anytime soon. Okay, I guess Maud isn't going to volunteer as an astronaut to save us from the next world ending event. Absolutely not, because if that happened, you're all fucked. So I'm doing everyone a favor. Uh, the Bob Dim says, you need to know your mass in space when you hit the wall inside the space station while moving around. Yeah, but I don't need to know. <laughs> do, you get, do you get me? I don't ever need to know this. Play the Board says, my college physics textbook was called Physics for Poets. It wasn't enough for me to have vague recollections of the science. 
but not the ability to verify it for myself. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa says, I see it going in one ear and out the other. <laughs> Lisa, you're with me. <laughs> this right. <laughs> like, Colleen, the Colleen's of the world are like, but <laughs> in Mars has different gravity. And Lisa and I are like, sure. Yep. Love it. Oh no, Darian's sending me oh, mapping Earth's gravity. Oh, I don't need that. Okay. Ridian says, two hours late here, but I thought I'd throw some subs to celebrate May the 4th. We're celebrating May the 4th by talking about space and being trapped on Mars. Um, but thank you so much for the gifted subs. I really appreciate that, Ridian. KB Dove says, the Earth is not a perfect sphere or, you know, oh, no, I don't. <laughs> the Earth is not a perfect sphere or uniformly dense. There are places where if you had a sensitive enough scale, you would weigh more or less than another place. Whoa. Kate says, expand your mind, Maud. Embrace relativi <laughs> relativism. What is relativism? Relat relativism. Ah. Huh. Wait until we start talking about the moon causing the earth to be oblong. See, what happened was there was so much to talk about in Project Hail Mary and it was so well explained that we didn't actually have to talk about science science, which is what we have to do now because they've upped the level of science. And not every one of us opted in for that discussion. KB Dub says when Maud's mum is here next week, we can talk relativ relativity. You can. Um... Time dilation while in space. Yeah, but they explained it to me so well. Where Rocky is like, bum, 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 and he's like, dude, no, that's what we learned, and I have to teach it to you. And I was like, look, if Rocky can get it, I can get it. <laughs> Thank you, Vaden. Yeah, Rocky had no clue. I know, and it killed everyone. Oh, it's a pun. <gasps> oh, it's a, of course it was, because KB, KB Dub said it. When your mum is here, we can talk relative. That's good stuff. Let's move on from that question. Is science described in? What What does Andy Weir do to make Mark Watney so likable slash relatable? Who wants to unmute and talk about that? What does Andy? Yes. I wouldn't say that he's likable or relatable. He's kind of like that that know-it-all kind of dude, like, uh, for lack of a better uh, explanation, he's like that that person that's in the DMV line who thinks that he's too good to be there, but he, he's trying to prove that he's really good, if that makes sense. It makes sense. Um, I just don't agree with any of it. Oh, okay. Well, that, that, that's that's the beauty of opinions. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, the, uh, the man is doing his job. He seems to be well-focused on it. That's great. He has very little personality, but when he does, it's, it's golden. But other than that, that's his only saving grace. That's just me. Okay, who else disagrees with Jimmy? I do. I do. Okay, catch 22. Why? I, okay, I, he's likable, and I think to me, because I find myself, like, when, you, when he reacts to something with sarcasm, I'm like, that is exactly how I would have reacted. So that um, makes him relatable and likable. Yeah, if we can if we can get into some of the maybe a little bit of spoiler territory. Yeah. Uh when he's talking to NASA and they're like, We haven't told the crew and he's like, What the fuck are you talking about? Tell the crew. You, yeah. you know, or you know, when they're like, they want to interview you about an investigation and he's like, he basically tells them to go take a long walk off a short pier. Well no, like, he actually that said something that was I would have told them that was coming. I was like, I get this guy because I would react the same way. Yeah. Okay. But at least that part of his personality, I I relate to. Okay. So some some find him relatable. Who finds him likable? I do. Tell me about. I really that. like it. It's just um kind of building on Catch Twenty Two. Um, his sense of humor, how he really doesn't give up. You know, he's like, I have this problem. I need to start breaking this down. I need to solve it. But he he uses his humor as a coping mechanism. But it it really endears you to him, and I get invested in his um survival, and I just like his personality. 
it's you know it's just the humor the the tenaciousness the um resourcefulness i just <laughs> like that character jimmy said i am certainly the minority in this lol <laughs> um Thierry says, I find Mark relatable and likable because I also cope with sarcasm. Uh, Colleen says, I like his sense of humor and his ingenuity. I agree completely with the likability uh, and the relatability. I think that if you're going to isolate, there is a part of you that kind of goes a little woo-hoo, and that is really great for us, the reader, because it's a lot more entertaining where it's like um, – you say what's on your mind, you stop being delicate, you you do use sarcasm. I think we also see a level of earnesty with him. Like he's, he got left behind. He got left to die by people that he's trained with for years. And he's adamant from the get-go, it was not their fault. It was an accident. Don't beat yourself up. It could have happened to anybody. And that sort of, that earnestness, I find to be incredibly endearing. Uh, and also likable. So we're seeing different sort of parts of his personality that are likable, but also like uh, earlier when they had the psychiatrist come in and say, he's so resourceful, he's incredibly resilient, his like will to survive and will to live is really, really strong. And the fact that he uses light- lighthearted moments when it could be quite serious and, and draining, he's actually really good for morale. And so he lifts and raises everyone's sort of morale through humor, which is a likable trait as well. Um, I don't understand. I think you missed a little bit, uh, a few too many words in that comment, Jimmy, for me to understand what you're trying to say. Thierry says the Martian movie won the Golden Globe for best comedy. Zach's here. Hi, Zach. He goes, oh, I read this like six years ago. It was amazing. Yeah, we're celebrating May the 4th by reading a space book. This is the second uh, Andy Weir book that we've covered for book chat. We did Project Hail Mary back in January, and now we're doing The Martian. Uh, same author. He uh, he basically talks about a lot of freaking science and dark themes like isolation, um, abandonment, shit going wrong, uh, you know, trying to survive with humor which is really cool. Um, Chris says he's able to put himself in the team leader position. He would have left his dead butt on Mars too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, really good point. Uh, Guy says, I loved the moment where they were like, I wonder what he's even thinking right now and immediately goes to him thinking about Aquaman. (laughs) Yeah, there were some really brilliant moments as well um, when, you know, he talks about, having all that time to kill, being excited about how cute the Poirot books, um, hating disco and that being a recurring theme is really, really fun. Um, trying to get approval for like any other music and getting denied. <laughs> um, Kate says, I admire Mark a lot as a character because if I were in that situation, it would be easy to fall into despondence and just give up. But he's like, okay, let's fix it and here's how. Um, I kind of want to talk about, you know, obviously the first part of this book where he is in isolation and has zero communication, his first thing is to fix that. He's lonely. He's really, really feeling the suffocation of isolation. And so he wants to talk to anyone. The fact that he said, I will talk about nothing with anyone for five minutes as long as as long as it's talking to someone. And as soon as he repairs communication and he has access to NASA, NASA absolutely start drilling him. They start micromanaging him, telling him what to do, needing full reports on everything. And he kind of then (laughs) preferred the silence. Um, But who wants to chat about the fact that it's like a bit of an all or nothing. The thing that he desired the most, which was communication, ended up being the thing that's pestering him. And he now doesn't like that feeling of... um, I guess, subordination, like he's, he has to answer to this team of people that he does feel back to your point, Jimmy, he does feel like he's more superior to intellectually, um, especially when it comes to botany and that he's answering to a bunch of people that are hypersensitive and that don't want him to do anything drastic because they have a very normal understanding of the futile position that he's in that one small mistake could be devastating. But for him, he says it's a Tuesday. Um, but does anyone want to talk about there you go, Kate. You've jumped in with a comment. Let's hear from you. Oh, 
Oh, where it's just kind of a little of the monkey's paw kind of wish where we as a species always think we want the things that we don't really want or need, like immortality. Like everyone thinks, oh, I'd like to live forever. In reality, that would be like the worst thing ever. So he's like, oh, I can't wait to talk to somebody. But then it's like, oh, the people I'm talking to are all nerd bureaucrats. So, of course, they're going to get super nerdy, bureaucraty, right? And I know, he just wants to get they're doing exactly what results. they're going to do anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's like he's talking to a committee of people. It's not like he just called up and is talking to a friend, right? Yeah. They're going to bureaucrat all over him. And I was just, did anyone else, I typed in the chat, did anyone else get the, like, for me, it was a Tuesday, which was a Street Fighter the movie reference. I don't know if anyone else got that. Oh, uh, that book. was? I didn't. I freaking love that movie <laughs> the movie street fighter movie with kylie minogue <laughs> australia's very own no i don't think many people caught that roll julia's last film yeah when bison says for me that was just <laughs> that's amazing um Gaia saying uh yeah the funniest part like when he finally gets communication and they say everything that you say everyone can read and he was like boobs <laughs> he put the boobs in the chat oh there it is we've got if you're in the um the discord as a patreon backer you can see the link that Darian just put in it's the clip of the line <laughs> that's amazing and I love that Andy we didn't actually specify what that reference was from he made it so niche that if you got it you got it and if you didn't then you're like me um Cubs and Braves oh it is baseball yeah um but Kate back to your point that you wrote about in the comments where it's like um that resilience and resourcefulness where I think it's such an achievement to see a problem or to be put <sighs> to face a problem, um, especially at this size and not be completely overwhelmed by it, but actually start looking at not one, but several different solutions. Even if you have to do it a step at a time where it's like, all right, I need space for my potatoes and then I'll figure out how to water them. Any of us, I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that if we were abandoned on a different planet, we'd be like, well, <laughs> there's a lethal and a dose of morphine. Maybe I'll do this for five days. <laughs> That's a great question. How long would you last in that situation? What do you think would kill you first? Probably for me, it would be my ineptitude of science. <laughs> I don't know what the gravity is, so I'm just going to step out and <laughs> die. Um, how, how would you die in this situation? Does anyone have an idea? I would think that I would just buy, anyone die. Anyone else from... first? Jimmy, you've gone first three times. Anyone else? If you don't go, Jimmy will go, but I think people are Definitely mainly... Definitely blow myself up. Okay, catch me too. Oh, everyone's commenting it. That's why. If you've commented it, mute and um, confess it. It definitely feels different if you're saying it out loud. Okay, I will read them. Catch-22 just said that he would blow himself up. Uh, Kate would take the morphine. Um, saying, I've never felt more in tune with Mark than in that moment because I despise, oh, that's the previous comment. Uh, but it's also a huge bureaucratic trait to micromanage someone who is actually in the situation from your remote head office location while ignoring the things the person is telling you who is actually there because you think you know better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is an instant face into brick wall. I get it completely. Um, the bulb dim says horribly. Gory says, I would forget to close something and then take my helmet off when I shouldn't. <laughs> Star Pilot 6 says I probably accidentally leave an oxygen leak somewhere and not notice. Piling says if dying first on Mars was a game, I would win. Man man's down. <laughs> That's great. Disco Cobra says I would try my best to survive as long as possible and then just die if I couldn't. Uh, Clever Girl says I'm too forgetful. That's why I won't skydive either. <laughs> oh, this is nice. I feel like I should be doing something. <laughs> uh, um, Jimmy, what's yours? It, it would probably be, you know, some Monday detail. I always forget some sort of decimal place or oh. something like 
that. So you wouldn't have a calculator. You'd be crunching some very, very important mathematics and you'd put the decimal in the wrong space. Exactly. And, and it also your... leaves me room to do an office space line, which I just did. So mm -hmm. there you go. <laughs> um, next question that I have. Oh, B Rock Vandal says, I was a submariner. I'd like to think I had a chance. B Rock Vandal, what would you do using your particular set of skills? Liam Neeson would kill anyone, but what would you do with your particular set of skills? Jay Buntrock? No, you're not B Rock Vandal. Mm, yes, you are. Yeah, yeah, I am. You Sorry. I, I'm in a hotel and my I just had to refresh my uh, thing, so I, I kind of missed some of it there. <laughs> oh, we're talking about how you would survive in Mars. I mean, I have absolutely zero skill set, so uh, my days would be numbered. A lot of people saying that we just don't have the brain power to be able to do the everyday things needed to survive in Mars. Um, play the board said I'd go losing and explore. Uh, I'd go exploring and I'd probably lose the hab. But you said that you're a submariner, so you'd have a chance. What is it about uh, your skill set that would help you survive in this situation? Yeah, I spent six years in in, uh, in an environment where you know you couldn't let the outside in. So any any mistake, I mean, it was with a crew, so it was a solo. But you know you had to be aware. You always had to watch. But, you know, because in a submarine, a fire could kill you within thirty seconds. Careful. So as long as I, you know, and, and uh, being in the in the, uh, I was a Navy nuke. They're they're inherently smart. So I think even the stuff I wasn't, I'm pretty good at figuring out stuff, even if I'm not experienced with it. I, that's what I said. I think I'd have a fighter's chance because even stuff I wasn't familiar with, as long as I had some manuals or some something, I could figure it out. Right. So we're choosing a team to go into space. We're choosing J Bunt Rock. I think we're all in, and Colleen, <laughs> we've got our smart people. Love it. Great. Um, Gory does help me out a lot because I'm feeling more and more inferior as I talk. I would be a PR team's dream. I would be stuck on Mars and I wouldn't do a Fonz, but I would somehow make that photo work. So yay. <laughs> it's got to count your wins, you know, that's, I'd be so dead, guys. I'd be so dead. Um, Catch Me Two says Navy Nuke is impressive. I was almost one. Wow. Manuals are certainly helpful. Yeah, you think I read those? No. Uh, we need to acknowledge that Watney is a botanist and a mechanical engineer, says Darian. Yeah, this is the thing. They're hybrid. They're two of the smartest people fused together. And I think his is great because it means that, A, yes, he can grow crops and um, sustain food for a longer period of time, um, which I don't think the rest of the crew would be able to do as efficiently or think of in that same way. And then, yeah, that, that line where he was just like the, the bison, <laughs> M. Bison line, that it's a Tuesday for him. <laughs> I'm going to use that and quote that all the time. Um but he can fix things if they break. And hearing the mentality of a lot of people back at NASA freaking out at the water reserve being broken, it's like, don't take it apart. You'll die if it doesn't work. It'll be over for you. And he's like, shut up. And he took it apart, fixed it at least somewhat temporarily um, and put it back together, you know. And I, I envy people like that. I think it's an incredible skill set to have. And, yeah, his his skill sets are so important in these situations mine are irrelevant in these situations but i would tell you what i'd be like soul seven still here <laughs> like and subscribe <laughs> oh no all right um yeah penny from big bang theory exactly exactly next questions that i've got how are we going for time crushing it how do you mm, i thought that this was a dark question when I wrote it, so let's tackle it. We already said how we're going to die when we're on the planet, but now let's flip it. How do you feel about spending hundreds of millions of dollars to save a single life? How do we choose who lives or dies, especially in high-risk operations like this or missions? Is it at loyalty or is it guilt that is fueling this rescue? Or is it the public's interest? Um, so that's my next set of questions. If you want to type it in the chat and I'll bring you up that way. If you want to unmute and go, just making sure that everyone has a chance to talk. Some people have spoken a lot more than others. So I really do want to get 
Thierry. Well, I think that because in the book NASA is a public domain and everybody finds finds out everything because it's pub, it's it's given to everybody. They had like no choice to save him once they knew he was alive because public perception would be against them. But if it was just like a government base and they didn't share anything, I'm pretty sure Mark uh, Mark Watney would be like a skeleton by now. Hundred percent. If the public never found out, they would have left him. So yeah. Kate, yeah. Kay Frito says, you use all the money needed. You use all. I think a lot of this is public face. Um, it's poor. Uh, yeah. Gory says, I think it's poor PR and therefore it's poor funding. Uh, the Bulb Doom says, it's whether or not the job can be done. But it looks like they're pulling every resource into making it happen. Baden says, I think it's not necessarily loyalty or guilt, but I think his knowledge of space being in those conditions is invaluable, especially when he's the best damn botanist on the planet. I didn't even think about it like that. The information that he's got from living on Mars, you know, the tests that he's got, the samples that he's made, how he's managed to, oh, I was going to say horticulture their culture over there, but as a horticulturist, but as a botanist, yeah, that that is super important information, practically worth $400 million. You're right. Pylang says, yeah, if you don't, no, uh, if you don't save him, NASA will uh, never do this again because people will boo them, thus hindering our chances of a Star Trek future. Kate says, it makes you wonder how many astronauts actually were left in space that we never heard about. Hmm. <laughs> Disco Cobra says, use whatever money necessary to save as many lives as possible. It's just morally the right thing to do. Possibly public opinion, not so much. Um, Catch Me Too says, by the way, fun tabletop game. What is? Did I say the name of one? Toast to Post says, who wouldn't want to be an astronaut if NASA didn't at least try? Yeah, spend the money. Uh, terraforming Mars. Oh, there you go. Colleen says it takes so long to get another mission to Mars that there's really not much more that they can do. I know that's the thing. This isn't like, you know, send out a ship into the uncharted waters and then, you know, flash a light and cover the ground. This is light years. <laughs> like it's it's not an easy thing and it's so expensive and, yeah, it's just a lot. So, but, I mean, he's just become an instant hero as well. Um, yes. I think it's I think it's the the underdog story. Everybody loves an underdog story, but once they find out that he's keeping himself alive, mm. well, you can't just abandon him now. And yes, it would be smarter to send spend millions on feeding thousands of homeless and stuff like that. But from the morale of all of humanity, you almost have to go get him one way or another. Yeah, for the sake of humanity, really great point. Um. Uh, B. Rock Vandal says, I think the book said nine months to get to Mars. Yes, but it also took about that to make the package, the to get the supplies or whatever that was even needed for it. And they didn't have a jet, that, uh, a rocket that could do it. So they had to take it from an upcoming mission that was going to set everything else back. Yeah, it's just, it's an absolute nightmare. What was, what was cool though to read was that the, de the departments at NASA are the most cooperative they've ever been. It took this to really unify and bring them all together. Um, I do want to bring up that thought, though, that I had where it was a throwaway line, but Mark, his objective was to open up the communications because he truly thought that if he was able to unlock the communications part of it all, that that would... He's talking about food. It's like if I get food and potatoes and the calories, that's what I factually need to live but if i unlock communications that's what will help me want to live and it was such a throwaway line but he made a reference that the communications having that basically like helped him want to continue being able to talk with people was his hope and without that he didn't think he was really going to make it and but he's got you know 400 plus days of food but I think the the psychology, the 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 mental part of it was sinking in. 
the physical part he was nailing, the mental part I, that was that was. I don't know, it was a really, really powerful line, but it was just, he said it kind of once and not, didn't touch on it again. It was just this big, like, I need this to, to, to keep going. Oh, and I thought that was like really powerful. Did anyone else catch that? Just me? Missed it. Yeah, no, it was a blink and you miss it moment, but I had listened to it twice and I was like, it was like physically being punched. Um... Where the communication, yeah, it's like that's where his cope came from. Hmm, interesting. The hierarchy of human needs, food, water, shelter first. Um, it also takes nine months, but they have to wait until Mars and Earth are in the right positions. Yeah. Andy Weir does really like uniting humanity for a cause in both this book and Project Hail Mary. Great observation, Vaden. That's the thing. I think that's what he's trying to really – get together especially I mean what was 10 years ago and where it is now where it's like we're all kind of so separate and we're fighting amongst each other when there are bigger problems that we just can't agree on yep that's where he's getting it KP Dub says I'm fine living alone not interacting with people as long as I know I can talk to others when slash if I need to yeah but imagine not having television, not having internet, not having your phone, not having books, having one album. Darian. You just made me think of a really interesting contrast between Project Hail Mary and the Martian. Yeah. In that he's stranded on Mars, but he's able to establish communication. And in Project Hail Mary, he is stranded and he literally has no communication at all until he is lucky enough to um, you know, chance upon Rocky. So it's just a interesting comparison there. But that's that when just... it goes from hopeless to hopeful yeah. when communication yeah. enters the picture. Yep. Yeah. Mm. It's just like Mark was able to actually establish communication and I really enjoyed his, that really emotional moment he had when it worked. And, you know, he actually had something to look forward to. And it was just the opposite for Project Hail Mary. But, and he couldn't establish communication, but he was able to meet Rocky. And that's how he got his hope. So mm. very two different scenarios. I did like with Project Hail Mary. And sorry, we're spoiling it for people that haven't read it. But um, understanding sort of like uh, Mark's main objective is to get home and to stay alive. But then you've got um, Grace's main objective was to save the earth and that could become at the cost of his life. So, again, it's like that great juxtaposition between the two that KP Dubs just said absolutely brilliantly. Colleen says his log was probably his saving grace in a lot of ways. Yeah, absolutely. Play the board says, I don't think you sacrifice like the workers um, – I don't think you sacrificed like the workers at NASA and JPL did for anything less than the notion that Saving Mark represented the hope of humanity uh, inherent in the space program. Yeah, really good point. That, and they were getting kick-ass over time. <laughs> um, in some way, Pathfinder is the Rocky of the Martian. It means that our hero has established communication with someone. Yeah. Maybe oh, talking to rocks. Rocky. Um, the next question. Does the way the story unfold uh, keep you enraptured since it's first person without much interaction? We kind of talked about this, how he's just doing a series of logs. It is first person. He's a reliable narrator, um, but he's not talking about feelings. He's talking about facts. We are not hearing sort of what is missing. Every now and then he kind of wants to check in on a, um, you know, ball sport game and get the results. But when it's not a journal in the sense of, dear diary, today I feel depressed. It's, um, all right, we're day number six and this is my strategy and these are the numbers and this is what I have to do and this is the, you know, it was very factual and void of the emotion side of it. Um, even though we got personality, trickled within that uh, toast person says listening to the book feels like listening to a podcast hmm. 
Gory says, I think the way the story starts off makes it a whole lot more impactful when it switches away from his logs. Agree. And Guy made a really great uh, observation about that earlier. He said something really fantastic. Um, I noticed, though, that Mark's never really talking about his family very much. Just when it was Thanksgiving and he was like, oh, yeah, they should all be there around the table. But I technically died 10 days ago, so this Thanksgiving is not going to be great. We don't know if he's got a family. We don't know if he's got a love back home. We don't know how old he is. We don't know where he's from. We don't know. We just don't. We know that he doesn't like disco. We don't know much about this guy. We don't really know his likes and dislikes. We don't know what makes him truly him. I mean, for Nerdist Book Club, we just read um, Dark Matter, which was so 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 about like every decision and will to live was all based around the love of his wife and child but here we just don't have that really important aspect of what it is to sort of um what i guess hum makes you a human humanizes that's it humanizes um why do you think that this isn't discussed why are we not learning about this? Lisa says, I think that's where my disconnect is with this book as opposed to Project Hail Mary. Um, what are some of the biggest differences? What do we know about, uh, what's his name? What's his first name? Rylan Grace. Ry Rylan? Ryan? Rylan. But Lisa, I want to hear a little bit more about that. Rylan, yeah. <laughs> Well, I just feel like with Project Hail Mary, I think because you got all of the flashbacks and uh, all the stuff that happened on Earth, you kind of got to know him more personally outside of what was happening on the ship. So I, I feel like with this one, you're not getting that um, but something that personal. Was, you know, I miss my kids. I'm a teacher. I teach middle school. This is what they were like. I really miss that. I worry about them. You know, like it had that con that connection back to Earth. Yeah, and and this, I feel like you just you just don't get that personal information from him. So I think that's probably why I'm not connecting as much with his character because I'm I'm more of a character reader, I think, and I, I'm not getting that personality or um, information that I need to really connect with them. Mm. Baden says, I think Mr. Necromancer mentioned it early on. Yes, she did. But I'll, uh, it allows Mark as a self-insert character. Agree. Colleen says, we also know Mark almost exclusively through his log and he wouldn't include all that personal stuff in his audio log. Oh, so it is being true to what he would be discussing in an audio log. Maybe we start seeing these cracks or we start learning a bit more about this in the second half of the book. But Colleen, do you think that this lack of character depth is helping or hurting the book in terms of the subject matter and his position? Um, I think it might make him harder to connect to uh, for a lot of people. Um, but looking at it... Uh, more from a realistic perspective, um, for me, this is more the way it would be. Um, I, I don't know if that answers your question. No, um, it does. We, we get some insight into his personality um, by his entries, but he's not going to include, you know, um, everything that... Uh, all of his feelings about the people he left behind or, um, you know, all of the things he's missing on earth, partly because he's got to stay focused on the problems at hand. Um, I wonder if what he, he gets... would say if he could, because he, he's so happy to talk about how bad his shit stinks um, <laughs> <laughs> on a public record or like what, he, what could end up being it, but he's not going to talk about the little thing called feelings. Yeah. Uh, but don't you think a lot of times it's easier to talk about something like that? Because e even that's pretty impersonal. Everybody shit stinks, you know? And it's it's not the same as um, really exposing your feelings to the world. 
Colleen, as an oversharer, I have, no, I have no problems telling the world how I feel at any given moment. In fact, it's harder for me to stick to the facts and stay on target. Uh, that's a that's really good though. I mean, this is your introvert versus extrovert, or your, um, you know, um, were you raised to express, or were you taught to internalize feelings? Yeah, be right. This is an astronaut. He, he's a man, literally on a mission, and just because he's still stuck there and everyone else has gone home, doesn't mean the mission's over. So he's still in that mentality. Uh, B. Rock Vandal, you made an amazing point as well between the difference between um, Project Hail Mary's Ryle and Grace and what we're getting right now with Mark Watney. Do you want to unmute and share that? Yeah, it's just uh, you get to you get to see Ryland's character arc where he he can he has the choice. Uh, I guess spoilers for Project Hill Mary if you haven't read it, but uh, you know he has the choice to go home, knowing that Rocky and his planet will die, and but he chooses to sacrifice himself to save that whole planet. Whereas you know Mark Wat Watney is just stuck in a situation where he just has to save himself, and there's there's nothing else there. So it's just there's no self sacrifice for his character arc. Um, and you hit the um, great point in your uh, comment where it was like he was forced into the mission. He the choice was almost taken from him in that particular instance. Like he was forced into all of this, and he has to and has to save the world. Whereas you know Mark Watney is an astronaut. He definitely volunteered to be there. Um, it's not against his wishes. He was the best person for the job. Um, yeah, so that those stakes are also removed. Uh, Kate says, in that situation, your feelings would be a can of worms you maybe wouldn't want to open either. It would lead to feelings of despair and worry and would make you think, some, uh, think about something other than the task at hand. And yeah, when you're in survival, that's all you have the luxury of doing, just thinking about the task and not letting those emotions in. You're right. That is a good point. Chris says, talking about feelings doesn't solve problems like running out of air. <laughs> well said. Maybe it's how I grew up, but you can cry later. There is shit to do. Um, yeah, it's also uh, interesting how people do operate under pressure. Um, some people kind of like flail, flail around, fall, literally fall to their knees um, and cannot cope. And other people, I will say, and this might surprise some people, but under duress or when adrenaline kicks in, I get shit done. I have my, I, I go into leadership mode. I'm like, right, you go over there. This, you need to do that. That's the problem. This is the solution and we need to do it. And then I will nearly throw up after I've seen all that blood because someone punched a window. Um, but yeah, it's not like, I think, it, did they say it in this book or was it another book that I was, no, I was just reading The Seven and the Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. Oh, it's such a good book. I loved it so much. It's like the closest to Project uh, Hail Mary 5, that kind of 5 that I've read. But there was talking about like when you feel all of that, like panic. Panic is a luxury when you are in those moments of um, complete duress where it's like you're exactly right. You just like you feel all that shit later right now. You only have the capacity to do that thing. And and actually having that thought process of feeling through those emotions, yeah, it's a luxury. You don't get that. You don't get that right now. You don't get that in this moment. Um, Gaia says, maybe anyone having mixed feelings about Mark feels this way because he's focusing on himself and the whole world is focused on him. It's easy to make it seem like he's selfish. Oh, that's a really good way to look at it. I didn't see it like that. Um, hello, dog. I moved her bed so that she appears in the frame now. Um, Kate says, Ryland Grace also wasn't a typical astronaut personality. He was drafted. He didn't choose it. People who choose that astronaut life are excellent at compartmentalizing and shutting down emotions in peril. If they don't, they fail the psych evaluation and they don't go up into space. Mm -hmm. Well said. Toast Poster says, think about what needs to be done and worry about what can happen. I know that feeling too. Yeah. Um, KP Dub says, same mode. I get very detached and logical and take over while everyone else is panicking. Emotions disappear. Um, great conversation. I really like that. Um, we've got, oh, different questions. 
uh, writing style, totally uh, effective with minimal physical descriptions. Uh, we don't, okay, who wrote that? Someone wrote that in the doc, but they didn't make it a color. Writing style, totally effective with minimal physical descriptions. Example, we, do, uh, we don't know ages or the appearance of anyone. What's the question? Who wrote that? Anyone? Viola? All right, moving on. Oh, that was me. Uh, Darian, talk me through this. The way that Andy yeah, Reid yeah. describes his characters, uh, minimal physical yeah. descriptions. Yeah. yeah, it was another question. It was just a, a point um, for discussion because this, this is something I mentioned to you back when we were doing Project Hail Mary that this is a style that I saw him use then and now. Um, mm -hmm. And well, I mean, the Martian, I think it's his first book. So he really was able to effectively tell the story and get us into the heads of these characters without really um, focusing on physical description or anything like that. It was, he really without was just in the state, in the, in the mental state of these characters. I don't know if it's because it's sci fi and not fantasy, but this is a male author who has not once referenced breasts <laughs> and how they fit into the uniforms or how they defy gravity um you're right we have very very minimal descriptions at all this could be very very helpful to the rachels of the world that have fantasia and struggle to um see or visualize these things anyway it can be very very hard for people that need to have distinct very separate um clear characters when this is all playing out instead of just being literally a name and that's the only identifying trait uh my next question that i had was did anyone look at casting before reading the book to help visualize this because this is a movie how many people's mark watney's were matt damon if you don't talk i'm gonna do that it's peanut butter Still tastes good. B Rock Vandal said, Mine was. Uh, Baden says, Or see the movie. Chris says, New writer. <laughs> yeah, boobs are out of this world. Jerry says, I saw the movie many, 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 many times before the book. K Frito called me on my burp. Fair enough. Play the board earlier says, I think the feelings that are there, if you look for them, they're just given in a matter of the uh, matter of a fact way. I fled to the river in terror. I'm not dead. Well said. Um, Jimmy did not look at casting, but Matt Damon was Mark Watney. Lisa says, yeah, I don't even notice it because I didn't pay attention to physical descriptions anyway, because I don't picture it. Uh, Guy says, I watched the movie so many times that even though the characters seem a bit different, I couldn't help but picture the cast. Kate says, I haven't seen the movie, but I know Matt Damon is the main character, so I did picture him. Chris says, sadly, I kept seeing Will Wheaton. <laughs> um, Cash22 says, I know about the movie, but I haven't seen it. Watney, definitely not Marky Mark um at least to me or damon uh clever girl says i'd seen the movie a long time ago but i can't remember a lot about it i couldn't picture matt damon while hearing will wheaton's voice there you go kp dub says i've never seen the movie or casting i knew damon stars but i still did not picture him or hear him while reading toast poster says i've seen the movie because of the book hype the movie was awesome and listening to the book was like an extended scene of the movie piling says why have feelings if they're just going to get you dead <laughs> something to ponder um, if you don't describe how they look, then I don't, I, they are nameless and they're, they're faceless. When I picture these scenarios and these scenes, it's, I kind of picture sometimes it depends. I have different ways that I ima imagine and visualize, but sometimes it's like kind of water paint, watercolors. And so I will have an outline of a body shape. I will see the evac suit. I will see the shapes, but the face is just like a puddle or a blur. Like it's not, they don't have like a face defining feature. But when someone says their bright blue eyes and their straight nose, I'm just, <laughs> and their, their pink lips with a cupid's bow, boom, like there she is. Like I can, I can clearly see that. Um, so if the author allows that information, I can have a more, uh, I wanted to say crystallized, but that's not it. Distinct a more accurate, clear depiction. If not, then they are not blobs, but they are more like dummies in a way. The outlines and colors, still colors, but like, yeah. KP Dub says, faceless, good word, Maud. I actually see Watney's mirrored space suit face shield most of the time. Yeah, because we didn't get a face. We don't get the description. Play the board says, Mark Watney is Mark Roba. Mark Roba. Mark 
Roba. A, a YouTuber? That's kind of cute. Who's that? <laughs> Mark Roba. Didn't, there you go. Thierry says, one of the rare movies in which Sean Bean doesn't die. Your clever girl says, I think I may see the equipment more clearly than the character because I'm more familiar with that. Yeah. Uh, but that was a good question, Darian. Thanks for bringing that one up. And it's interesting to see how people um, see this. Vaden's got a bunch of questions. Vaden says, what is it like to be truly alone on a different planet for months? Does, does Watney's overall upbeat attitude fit in the stress of the situation? Or is his astronaut training and positivity the only reason he stayed sane? Vaden, what do you think about your own question? Okay. Well, um, I thought that uh, I didn't really get into it too much because he seemed he – seemed very positive the entire time like he didn't really outside of a couple moments um for the most part he seemed like he was just like always gonna he had a couple of yeah yeah <laughs> he, was, he was good for the most part though like he seemed very very positive overall and I, and it, it part of his training it makes sense like but i did wish that it was um i got to see him you know deal with the stress more but maybe it'll happen later on i don't know well, I mean, we made a really good point earlier as well. He's doing journal entries as if he's on a mission and he's contacting NASA. So um, kind of talking about his real feelings or being freaked out. I mean, he does have those moments where he's like, fuck this, because he's, he's frustrated at his problem solving, you know, and the situation. But you're right, not really tapping into the other stresses um, or panicking or hyperventilating or freaking out like he's really quite put together and I think that that is his personality type and why he was chosen on the mission anyone else get any thoughts of that clever girl says just keeping busy helps ward off despondency mm -hmm. yeah uh Ridian, thank you so much for gifting five more subs Aziel's Luffy Luthy Raven Lunatic Jacob Drake Jane the Geek and Broken Bow Ranger all just got gifted a sub thanks to you and Broken Bow Ranger's like hey dude thanks for the sub Broken bow, you've been lurking, huh? Oh wow, we got quite a few people watching this. Ugh. Well, guys, you got to chat. If you've if you've read the book, talk talk to us. Um, does anyone else have anything else to talk about? Is it uh, Mark Watney's personality that means that he's kind of suited for life and death situations more? Chris says he keeps the log format. It gives him focus for his days. Play the board says the first names are the same and they use both nasa engineers solving problems i never even imagined and doing it with a good deal of humor Baden says kind of wonder how the other crewmates would have fared oh yeah yeah and i well i want to get i really want to get to know the crew a little bit better we've got beck who's really good with like back pain um we've got vogel who's very stereotypical <laughs> i think he's german um johansson who's like the data analyst and really good with computer and cryptic and all that kind of stuff um and then you got lewis who's the woman who's running the whole thing so yeah i really kind of would oh and martinez uh who's the pilot i remember him from the movie because i like michael Pena. i think he's freaking awesome he's a good egg the next question was how effective was learning about the crew's personalities slash hobbies through the media that they left behind oh great question because Lewis likes disco and 70s stuff. So you kind of get an idea of her age. But you're right. There are clues that are being left about. Um, you know that uh, Martinez has a three-year-old. So he's a dad. I wonder how long he's been in the same room as his kid. I like that question. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? Being a botanist helps him actually come up with a better plan for survival. Mm -hmm. The cross that he smuggled onto the ship. Thank you, Chris. There you go. That's very telling as well. But yeah, you're right. Those little, how effective was learning? Subtle, Vaden. Subtle. <laughs> it was subtle. Um, and then your last question was, if NASA wasn't forced to show the world that Watney was alive, would they have kept it a secret until they possibly rescued him? If you're asking Kate and I, we thought that they would have just... Doo -doo -doo. But to everyone else, if NASA wasn't forced to show the world that Watney was alive, 
would they have kept it a secret until they possibly rescued him? Broken Bow Ranger says, my lips are zipped on spoilers. Next week, we are going full spoiler. We're talking about the whole book and my mum's going to be there. <laughs> Lisa says, I think so. I think so. Um, and then Catch-22 said, a couple of events actually took me out of the story. No spoilers, but happy to talk about them in chat. Catch-22, is that Colleen's argument about the um, tweaking of factual science? Uh, no, it wasn't. Although when she mentioned it, my immediate brain was, I wonder if the rocket is top heavy and it has a high center of mass and that's why it would actually fall over in a low wind. But that's beside the point. Um, no, the things that, the things that took me out of the story were one, when he was talking about taking the laptop outside mm. and the liquid crystal display and the laptop went, you know, went yeah, by. Right. I'm like, wait a minute, time out. You're telling me NASA sent astronauts to Mars with LCD screens and not light emitting diodes? No. That's <laughs> like, what I was, they don't that's have what I was thinking too. <laughs> Like, that's ridiculous. Of course they would be sitting there with LED screens and it wouldn't matter. Um, so that one kind of took me out of the story a little bit just because my brain was like, that doesn't make, make any sense. And then the other one was when there's, a, there's like a split second of flashback in italic text in the book and they're talking about a thing and I'm like, that's going to try to kill him. And as soon as it went to that flashback, I'm like, this is going to try to kill him. I already know what's going to happen. Um, and that kind of predictability took me out of the story a little bit. Gosh, me too. What does it feel like being so smart when you read things? What is that like? I don't. I don't know. I couldn't describe it. Does it wreck? But it's. Does it's. It wreck my it's to me. It's, it's like a like, weird. Like, oh, it's like a weird suspension of disbelief because when I read, it's like watching a movie. Uh -huh. To me, so then that happens, and I'm like, I'm kind of taken out of the movie for a second. Um. And then it was just kind of like that caught me. I was like, okay, whatever. KP Dubs does say ignorance is bliss. And in this case, you just don't, you don't get the luxury of ignorance. I can't help it. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't want to help it. You're like, more <laughs> to learn. It is cool though. Like, J Bunt Rock with like submarine skills. So cool. Cash 22, you said you were going to do that job, but you didn't. Does that mean that technically J Bunt Rock is smarter? Uh, probably. Um, I, I've tried to get into the Navy when I was much younger, and I did well enough on my ASVAB that my Navy recruiter was like, they're going to ask you if you want to do nuke, and if you don't want to do nuke, you have to say no, and they're going to have to say no like eight times. Um, and then I ended up, I ended up not getting into the Navy because of uh, some medical things. Oh wow! That disqualified me. So. B Rock Vandal. I became a, I became a structural engineer instead. A structural engineer. So this like stuff. Yeah, there is definitely a like all all the left brains when it comes to this kind of stuff where you're like, wow, I actually get to try and figure out what scale and degree of movement would make things impossible or improbable or affect, you know, like the launch. Um, he's got 12.5 degrees until he can no longer kind of take off. There are some brains that thrive on trying to figure that out. And then there's mine. Right side brains, where are we at? Where are we at? All we care about is emotions. That's the catch is like, that's what I do. You know, I'm like, where are my right brains at? And Kate says, I work in a bookstore. I'm like, there we are. <laughs> Lisa says, we're here. <laughs> I can hook up a shower main. Hey, there you go. Vaden's kind of half and half. Yeah, and that's what's so good about Dungeons and Dragons. You do have the left brain, like, um, oh my God. Mm, turn on, turn on. Um, you know, numbers. You got the numbers side of it. What are the fucking numbers? You've got the statistics? No. You've got the... Analytical. The analytical side. Yep. Yep. 
Yep, and then you've got your role playing where it's like, but my character is like this because of the trauma that they faced when they tried to best their older brother who they always lived in the shadows. You know, so storytelling, but then you've got, oh, odd, whoa, odd, uh, a, hold on, odd ball, but 8A11, but I get it, odd ball. So sorry, aerospace engineer. What did you say before that? Why did you say sorry? Oh. You're an aerospace engineer? Are you an aerospace engineer? Terry says, I make fake things in movies and TV shows, and sometimes they're a thing of nightmares. I mean, not many people can say that, Terry, so that's a really good thing. Um, Toast Poster says, logic, puzzle, patterns versus story and emotion. Oh, he said structural. Ah. Uh, as a wannabe writer and once journalist, I think I fall in the middle. Yep. You got a degree in business, Jimmy. There you go. <laughs> Feeling dumb in the chat crew. <laughs> hey! <laughs> but let me tell you about how this character made me feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I went away from nuclear power and went into the electrical industry. Wow. Wow. Um, I, I think I've explained this in my family. My, my mum's a psychologist. And so mum and I are like, let's talk about how we're feeling all the time. And my dad's a surveyor and all the men in my family. So him and my two older brothers are like, let's try and find out how fast a plane has to fly to constantly be flying in daylight. And my mum and I are like, cool. And then they're like, have fun with your feelings. <laughs> That's my family dynamic. My BSc, what's that? Bachelor of Science was surveying, says Darian. There you go. Two, my dad and my brother is a surveyor. My other brother is a data analyst. <laughs> and so when I was like, I want to be on camera, they went, go to another country. <laughs> Get out of here with that attitude. Uh, Broken Bow Ranger said, I just got done leading a meditation class and I'm also a music teacher. So my guess is right brain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Music, very emotive. Meditation, it's all about not thinking. <laughs> and left brain is literally like, let's think a lot. Um, but music is a mathematical language too. Yes, two, three, four. But I was really good at that. I played the drums, so I knew about the numerical beat. But it's also you can feel the beat. You can feel it. Um, Isaac says, I'm an electrical networking engineer and currently studying psychology. Boom! Isaac is literally doing both of those, which is so interesting which is why you've read this book every single year. Hmm. Music is how I get my right brain fix. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting, everyone. Hey, let's look at the casting. Ugh, wrong way. I had one job. One direction. All right, starting here. Matt Damon. Uh, Mark Watney. This is our um, commander of the ship. Nope. Maybe next week I'll have a bit more brain. Uh, Jessica Chastain made the decision. She was the one who said, we got to go. Uh, Mackenzie Davis was the girl in the satellite who found the pictures and pieced together that Mark Watney was still alive. Kate Mara is the astronaut. That's all the crunching numbers and computer stuff. This is the doctor, Sebastian Stan. I can't wait to watch this movie to figure out how Sebastian Stan is going to be a credible aerospace doctor. <laughs> That'll be interesting. Um, moving it along, Kristen Wiig uh, 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 is Annie Montrose, who is the very ballsy PR person. Fuck you, I need a photo. Get him with his helmet off. Uh, we can't do that. Why not? He'll die. Well, <laughs> do it. Yep. Uh, Naomi Scott is Ryoko. Now, I don't think we have a Ryoko in the book. Am I wrong? Or are they a forgettable character? Donald Glover is Rich Purnell. Same question. Who are those characters? Uh, Chiwetel Ijefar is Vincent Kapoor, who I pictured as a <laughs> not that good looking, trust me. My Vincent Kapoor was like 65, um, a little overweight and more Indian or Pakistani is how I pictured him, Kapoor. Jeff Daniels is Teddy Sanders. Teddy Sanders looked like, a, again, like a 60 something uh, football coach <laughs> in my head. Sean Bean is Mitch Henderson. I think he's very, very well cast. I couldn't really picture him. 
Michael Pena is the pilot, the astronaut, uh, Rick Martin, Martinez. Uh, As A Axel Henny is the, what did he specialize in? He specialized in, I don't know, he did all the soil, he wanted to do all the samples, I thought, the rock samples. So he was a geo dude. <laughs> let me have it. Let me have it. Uh, Nick Muhammad, who we know from Ted Lasso, was Tim Grimes, the very unlikable communications guy. Benedict Wong is Bruce, and I don't remember that character either. But anyway, they're our main cast that we had. Astrochemist. Astrochemist. Um, I would like everyone to try, if you can, if you have time, to watch the movie because next week we're going to be talking about the second half of the book. And I wouldn't mind having a bit of discussion on the comparison between the book and the film. I don't remember this movie being funny at all. I don't remember Matt Damon making the character somewhat funny. Cash 22 said, I did not picture Jessica Chastain, not even close. Well, yeah, she liked discos and 70s stuff and Hercule Poirot, you know, so she should have been a couple of decades older. Sebastian Stan and Kate Mara would have been like 28. Wait, 10 years ago? They're about 35, but 25. How the fuck is that realistic at all? Oh, our neurochemist biochemical engineer is this 25-year-old model. Yeah, okay. Terry says we might cover the movie in the Gig Bomb Watch Along this month. Oh, you got to beat me to it. Uh, Lisa says, yeah, I want to rewatch it after I finish reading it. Uh, Clever Girl says, I want to finish the book before I rewatch the movie. Same. I'm going to power out the movie and then hopefully watch it early next week. I mean, power out the book, sorry. Uh, it's not a funny movie, more of a deep impact feel, says Jimmy. Uh, Catch Me Too says, smart people can be young and good looking. I just happen to be neither. <laughs> but you're funny and sometimes that's far more important. <laughs> Um, smart people can be young and good looking. You're right. Uh, KP Dub says this book is a fast read. I think I can finish it tomorrow and then watch the movie and then maybe read it again by next week. I've listened to the first half of this book twice because you're right. It is easy. I still need my next book. I read Sevelyn, um, seven, Sevelyn, seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo. Um, I need my next book. Aaron's been trying to get me to read Dead Witch Walking for two and a half years which is kind of like a female-led Dresden, which is how he sold it to me, which is a way, to, a good way to sell it. I bought the book twice accidentally. Um, oh, you're not here, Aaron. Oh, you had to dip. Okay. Uh, and the other book that I was thinking about reading was The Cruel Prince by Holly Black. <gasps> Kate, you started reading Evelyn Hugo? Fuck, I'm probably going to make everyone read it. I'm probably going to make everyone read it. I loved it. Oh, Kate, DM me when you get to the end of that book. Because I know sometimes you'll have feels about things that maybe I don't and I'll have feels about things that you don't, but I'm really interested. Go tell me. Or otherwise I'll make everyone else read it. <laughs> Colleen says, I have too many books. <laughs> tell me about it. Play the Beard says, I sat next to Jeff Daniels in a play, so I'm hyper aware when I see him in a movie. Um, I was going to suggest Star Wars Into the Void as a book. All righty, pop it in the list. Pop it in the list. Girl's snoring. It sounds like she's dying, but she's doing okay. Uh, all righty, everyone. I'll see you next week. Um, everyone, be good to my mum. I've, like, asked her to be involved in book club because that's what her and I bonded over when we were growing up. And I said it would mean a lot to me, so now she's going to read the book and join in. So it'll be really cool to have mum there. Uh, all right, everyone. Who are we going to raid into? Uh, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. I'm hungry. I know why. There is a day that all women know about a day. Hey, downtown CM Brown. Thank you so much for the follow 11 minutes ago. Um, but it is called the bottomless pit day where us ladies can just eat nonstop all day and don't even get a little bit full. It's very annoying and very expensive. Play the board says, I like that so much. Mm. Uh, because it's Monday, I like reading in, it's not, it's Wednesday. Jason Charles Miller used to do Music Mondays, but he's doing it on Wednesdays now. But I love reading into him because he puts, he puts on a free, did I do that? He puts on a free, no, I botched it. He puts on a free concert and he's so talented. I can't stick around though. Where is it? It is. It's Jason Charles Miller. How did I get it wrong? What is this devilry? Uh, 
Enter. What? I'm reading it. Jason Charles. It was wrong. Why can't I get it? All right. Well, I'm. It's just not my day. Ah, oh, that's why. There it is. Alrighty, we're heading into Jason. Have a free concert. Pour a wine. Enjoy it. He's fantastic. You're in for a good time. Tell him Maud sent you. Drop some bombs over there. Um, also, yes, we have a poll happening in our Goodreads. Come join our Goodreads. We've got a poll going. We're voting for June's book. Get your uh, vote in because we're going to be announcing it next week. Thank you for the reminder, Lisa. Bye, everyone.